Is he attractive? I think so. He's really masculine in this way that I think is so Korean. Are you attracted to him? I don't think so. I don't know. I mean, I don't think so. He was just this kid in my head for such a long time. And then he was just this image on my laptop. And now he is a physical person. It's really intense, but I don't think that that's attraction. I think I just missed him a lot. I think I miss Seoul. Did he miss you? I think he missed the 12 year old crybaby he knew a long time ago. You were a crybaby? Yeah. Most of the time, he'd have to just stand there and watch me. When is he leaving again? Hey everybody, it's Neil Pasricha, and welcome to chapter 133 of Three Books. I was thrilled to see Past Lives, the astounding, slow-moving, yet somehow fast-paced film, debut film from Celine Song, get nominated for Best Picture recently. Okay, so Best Picture, there's no higher nomination for a film. And this is, remember, her first film. She was also nominated for Best Screenplay, which, you know, as a show that focuses on books and writing, uh, there's, again, no higher honor. Last year around this time, we interviewed Daniels, who were nominated for Best Screenplay for Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. And, of course, we've interviewed Quentin Tarantino, who's been nominated for Best Screenplay himself for Pulp Fiction, amongst others. So we've got this Best Screenplay vibe kind of happening here, which I love. Anyway, this is her first film. And not only was it nominated for Best uh, Picture and Best Screenplay, She's also been nominated for five Golden Globes, three Critics' Choice Awards, three BAFTAs, and a Directors Guild of America nomination. So this is pretty impressive. Leslie and I actually loved past lives so much that we went back and saw it again in theaters, which is pretty rare because we don't make it out to theaters that much. And so to go back and see the same film, it was like, we just loved it so much. There's so much happening. The film had such a unique energy. It told the story of Nora and Sung, two childhood friends in South Korea who lose touch when Nora's family emigrates and then seem to be forever chasing the goodbye they never had. Um, the, the film opens with this really intriguing, like, what's going on sort of late night bar scene in New York City with Hey Sung visiting Nora and her husband before scrolling back to tell the unpredictable, jumping around the decade story of how they got there. Every single shot in this film is like a elegant visual, sumptuous visual feast from silhouetted lineups for the Staten Island Ferry to broken transmission Skype calls in the early 2000s to a final waiting for an Uber scene that deserves its own prize. And the writing, as I mentioned, is crisp. It is punctuating. There is so much said with so little. Past Lives is a truly magical film. I don't recommend it. I can't recommend it enough. Did I say I don't recommend it? I do recommend it. I can't recommend it enough. And if don't just take it from me, it's got 96% on Rotten Tomatoes, which means whoever you take to see it, 96% chance they're going to love it too. I was thrilled that Past Lives director, writer, and filmmaker Wunderkind, Celine Song, joined me on Three Bucks from her New York apartment to talk about the Korean concept of in Yun, why we are actually drawn to stories in the first place, what unique role millennials play as the last pre-internet immersive generation, how a cannibalistic orgy makes for great literature, a surprising cure for loneliness, why sensory deprivation increases chemistry, the other job of a filmmaker and director, Celine Song's three most formative books, of course, and much, much more. This was a joyous, rapturous celebration. I, I can't I love the movie Past Lives, so to get to talk to the person behind it was just a real treat. Celine Song, thank you so much for coming on Three Books. Now, all of us, let's flip the page into chapter 133 now. Hey, I just hit record. Hi, Celine. Hi. Oh, my gosh. It's so great to see you. Thank you so, so thank much you for coming. You. Thank, you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for the gift that is Past Lives. It, it was unbelievable. I've seen it in theaters twice now. Oh, my God. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. And I took completely different notes both times. Like the yeah. things I noticed were just so different both times. I was surprised by that. But 
feels like one of these movies that every time you come to it, it's just got something different to tell you. I'm so glad. I mean, I feel like because um, because you're in Canada, right? Yeah. So I, really, I, I want to know. I would love to know, like, which theaters you went to. And it, yeah, it was because... at both times at the Varsity Theater. Oh, yeah. OK, cool. Yeah, yeah. I love that theater. <laughs> it's so special. It's, you play so many good movies there. So I was just so glad to be able to show past lives there. So I'm so happy you saw it there. Because so you can't, you emigrated from Korea to Toronto, Toronto then to yeah. New York. Very mm-hmm. similar to a certain someone in the movie. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. And so I you've been really very kind to give by. us. Yes, it's it's you've been very kind to give us your three most formative books. But I thought before we do, because you've written this masterpiece, I might revisit three lines from your movie for you. And I'm going to present these back to you with the assumption that the people listening right now, the three brokers listening are familiar with past lives. But if they're not, these are three lines that sort of just jumped out to me from the movie. And I'm just going to offer them to you to see if you had a reflection about them or you want to explain a little bit what you were thinking as a writer when you put them in. First up. First up, because Koreans don't win the Nobel Prize of Literature. <laughs> um, well, you know, I feel like that really is about is something that um, really reveals character about this character of Nora immediately, right? Because I think that the always sometimes uh, the way that uh, immigrants are depicted is that immigrants are sometimes depicted as uh, being reluctant to immigrate, especially children. They're reluctant to immigrate. And I really wanted Nora to be somebody who is a natural-born immigrant, someone who really wanted to leave, who really wanted to, uh, who had her own ambitions even as a little kid, you know, and and very immigrant ambitions. Because when I live in New York City, which is, New York City is very much a city of immigrants, so is Toronto, but um, but New York is... um, is historically also just like a symbol of immigration, like the Statue of Liberty is a symbol of immigration. And something that was really true is that um, when I talk to, um, sometimes when I'm like talking to the people, uh, let's say someone who drives me, right? They all have, uh, when I start getting to talk to them, they actually have uh, stories that involve uh, amazing ambitions. And and I really root for them for, you know, uh, being able to uh, do it, like so, so I'm saying, it's like like an Uber driver yeah. um, might say something like, uh, "I'm going to win the uh, the Nobel Prize for Literature." So it is something that is kind of a lovely and un, unbridled part of uh, immigrants. And I wanted Nora to be somebody who was an immigrant from the beginning. I love that. I love that. A natural born immigrant and the unbridled sense of possibility that helped her leave Korea and head for New York. The second quote I have here is, and this made the audiences I was watching the movie with laugh out loud both times. <laughs> is he is he attractive? Uh-huh. <laughs> Well, I mean, I feel like so tell, uh, tell us this. Tell us that scene. Just just a ten second contextual yes, setting. Of course. That line just punctuated. It does. I mean, the thing is, it's like you know the 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 main character Nora. Um, uh, she spends her time with her uh, child sweetheart, who she's seen for the first time in twenty four years, and it's like a, it's, and it's like a, and the actual meeting itself is a meeting of two old friends. But then when she comes home, um, her husband that she lived with in New York City, she uh, he just asks some questions about uh, this childhood uh, uh, friend. And the, the, well, the first questions that he asks is, is he attractive? And I think the truth is that because Tao Yu, who plays the character of Hesong, the child sweetheart in the film, uh, he, I think that that's why the audience laughs, because he is... Um, He's a beautiful person <laughs> as, a, as an actor and as a as just yes. a person. So I think that because we all have, um, as an audience, agreed that he is so attractive, I think that that's why it's so funny. It's like it's, it's like dramatic irony. Oh, we're that's like, interesting. Yeah, I think that's why yeah. they laugh. Yeah. Well, I laughed because I was like, I thought it was like the classic guy reaction to, you know, a woman telling you all about his personality and so on. And he's just like, wait, wait, is he attractive? Like, what's look, give me the... <laughs> Yeah. Our first impressions, but, but I think that I think you're right too. I think that part is. I think I bet it's. I bet it's partly both. I bet people maybe feel that there's a whole group of people who feel that way, and there's a whole other group who feel like, um, who who feel like, uh, 
wow, wouldn't you like to know? You know? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, exactly, exactly. You wouldn't believe it. You know? Exactly. It's a great, great line. And then the other line was actually never said, but it was written. And I've been researching this line online on Reddit forums and on Twitter. And I'm not the only one who wants you to open this line up. It is a one word title of Arthur's book. Oh, <laughs> which is in a throwaway scene, not throwaway scene, but like a quick it scene. Is. Where he's yeah, yeah, yeah. Book. It was establishing scene, mm-hmm. establishing scene. Sorry. And so can you tell us the title of his book, which you, you never we never hear discuss. And it's got like somebody says on Twitter, why is the why is this book called? I'll just reveal it. Boner with the <laughs> Jeff Koons balloon dog on the cover. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think that to me, the main thought I had was that like, I wanted it to feel like so, so, so New York, right? And I wanted it to be believable that it is, a, it is, uh, he's an amazing writer too. And that's how these titles are, you know, if it's a great book, if it's a successful book, and if it is something that is like really, really, really New York. Because I think that you can also, the title could be all kinds of things. It could be uh, more poetic and you could be that. But I, what I really wanted was like, no, no, this is one of those like, you know, one of those like a uh, hit books. Like, it, you know, like it, his Hilt Nows has a book called White Girls. Right. And so okay. it's like, and then, so I want, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And say, well, same with the balloon dog, right? I guess that's part of the. Yes, of course. It just has to feel like um, uh, it is actually like something that only like a really hip New Yorker who you know what I mean, can really write. So I feel like that's really the thing that really drove me for it to be something that uh, stood out like that, as opposed to like, you know, like if it was like some some beautiful or pretty traditional name, then that is unclear if uh, what kind of a book he writes. But if he writes a book called Boner, I knew that we're all going to know what kind of a writer he is, which is like, uh... you know, yeah, <laughs> that's really how I felt about it. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you for going deep on there. And you said there's a, you said there's a book right now out there like this called White Girls. Is that what you said? The Hilton Owls has a book called yeah. White Girls. White Girls. Okay, great. Um, for example. Yeah, um, yeah, just as, as one yeah. example of, of a book. Yeah, okay, is, wonderful. Yeah. Well, you've given us three formative books, and I know I want to kind of keep us moving. So the mm-hmm. first book, for each book, I'm going to kind of – Show it up to the camera for people that are watching on YouTube. And I'm going to try to describe it for people that are listening so that they can kind of feel like they're holding the book in their hand. Um, so I'll take about 30 seconds to describe it. And then I'll ask you to tell us about your relationship with you, with each one. And there's right. a, a follow-up question or two for each. Okay. So the very first book is holding up to the camera, Perfume, The Story of a Murderer by Patrick Suskind. If I said that right, there's an umlaut over the U, S-U-S-K-I-N-D, originally published in German in 1985. It's got a mesmerizing kaleidoscopic dark orange, light orange, yellow image, which upon closer examination appears to be a dancing naked woman with her back, with her neck kind of back and to the right. Patrick Suskin is 74 years old, the only living author of the three books you've given us, and he lives as a recluse in Germany and France, it is believed. The public knows little about him. He's withdrawn from literary life completely, and there are no photos or even interviews of him, at least not in the last 30, 40 years. What is this book about? It's, by the way, translated 49 into 49 languages and sold over 20 million copies. Been on Der Spiegel's bestseller list for over 10 years. What's it about? It's set in the 1700s in Paris. It's a very non-genre type of literary historical fiction, sort of fantasy, maybe horror type of novel. Wonderfully written, and it shows and explores the relationship of smell with the emotional meanings that sense may have. Patrick Suskin's novel provokes a terrifying examination about what happens when one man's indulgence in his greatest passion, his sense of smell, leads to murder. It takes place in the slums of 18th century France where the infant Jean-Baptiste Grenou-, Grenou is born with this one sublime gift, an absolute sense of smell. File this one. Do we decimal his? Do I have the filing number? I usually do, and I've lost it right now, which is shameful on me. But either way, let's pass it over to you, Celine. Tell us about your relationship with Perfume by Patrick Suskind. Well, I think that the the depth of uh, the story is about how, um, of course, his sense of smell or uh, how how amazing his sense of smell is, how perfect his sense of smell is, is described so beautifully that I completely uh, believe it just in the language. It feels like uh, it's one of the most like lush uh, books when it comes to uh, sensory uh, everything. It felt like the whole time I was reading it, I was smelling every single scent that they were describing, which I really love. But honestly, the the truth is that, you know, the main character uh, does not have a smell of his own. So to me, it really is about this person who does not have a humanity of their own. 
And as a result of them, they themselves not having a humanity of their own, they're um, uh, grasping at and they have erotic desire for um, other people's smells. And I think that, uh, which is another way of saying like other people's humanity. So it's the main character of this mm. book is one of the loneliest uh, characters I've ever uh, encountered in so many books that I've read. And I remember, um, I think that the really the reason why the book is uh, so incredible is like, of course, the book is good the whole time, but the ending of it, right? Um, I don't know. Only, I, I have to admit, I've read the other two, but I'm yeah. on page 67 of this. <gasps> okay, so I'm not going to so, give it away. Do, Should well, I give it, what do you think? Uh, well, I, I, <laughs> we get calls from our listeners telling us to stop spoiling books. It's hard to say because it's been yeah. in print for almost 40 years here. Yeah. But, <laughs> so true. But <laughs> Well, I can, I, can, I can mention it. I can but, talk yeah, about it a little bit. To, okay, well, this is the spoiler alert. Okay, so fast spoiler. forward a minute or two if you don't yes. want to hear. I want to hear your view of what the ending reveals. So that well, we... the ending is just like, you know, it's this amazing thing where, you know, the, the whole time, the, uh, the reason why the main character uh, kills and turns people into perfumes, which is what happens in the film, is because uh, he himself wants to uh, wear the perfume of others, a perfume uh, made of others, right? And yeah. uh, the reason why is because he himself longs for humanity. He himself longs to be uh, a person. And uh, and at the end, of course, um, he, he is about to get caught and uh, he pours all the perfumes that he's made with uh the uh, people that he loved, and especially one of the women that he in some ways loved, although I think he's a psychopath, so I think it's very difficult for him to actually love. Uh, he, instead of uh, making love to a woman, what he does is he turns her into a perfume and he tries to wear her scent, right? So um, he pours uh, bottles of perfume, uh, this very potent perfume over himself. And then um, the all of, uh, you know, everybody in his city, um, uh, has an orgy and they <laughs> take off their clothes and they make love with each other and they also completely devour him they eat him and i think that you know it's one of the uh, most shocking endings in that way where i feel so completely uh satisfied like i myself have uh eaten him and eaten the book and i think that Ooh. that always makes me feel like it is the uh, I don't know. I think about it so often as a guidance for how I uh, look at my own endings. You know, when I as, when I when I write. What yeah. do you mean? I want it to feel like um, uh, the the meal that you've been waiting for arrives. You ah, know? <laughs> oh, that's a great. Metaphor. Or the perfume that you've been waiting to get poured over you uh, is poured over you. You know. Yes. Yes. The meal that you've been waiting for arrives. I can I, I can tell when you say that you you weren't a fan of Lost, probably. <laughs> <laughs> that wheel never arrives, does it? No, uh, no, no, of course. And then, and then you feel like, um, and it's interesting because I feel like if you have an ending that where if you have the food uh, that arrives and it's delicious, right? And this is true about going to restaurants too. Um, you are just uh, so uh, glad for it that uh, you maybe have forgotten how late the food has come or you may have forgotten yeah. the other parts of the restaurant experience. Maybe that you didn't enjoy. Maybe you didn't like the location, but. As long as the food arrives and it's delicious, uh, uh, you're going to be happy, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting, too, because the climactic and final scene of Past Lives is very memorable. I won't say more about it right now for those that haven't watched it, but it's got you you deliver on the meal. Absolutely. <laughs> but that point about how good it can taste and how good, how satisfying it feels makes me think a little bit about sensory deprivation. And I want to talk to you about that specifically. Because this book is described as a hauntingly powerful tale of murder and sensual depravity, mm -hmm. which I thought was interesting because in the 2003, October 2023, NPR Fresh Air interview with your past live star Greta Lee, she says that you instructed her and Tao Yu, uh, who plays Hei Sung, not to touch. You know, not to touch. She couldn't touch him. He couldn't touch you. And even that the film's opening scene, which I found mesmerizing when she was talking about it, was actually the first time her two co-stars actually met in, in real life. And so there's something you were doing as a filmmaker there mm -hmm. that I wanted to open up a little bit. How do you think about sensual depravity, which I know is a, a darker way to describe it because that's, <laughs> that's what this book, but there's something about sensual deprivation that you're doing as well how how did you how do you wield that 
Or how did you wield that? Or how, how do you think about that? Well, the truth is that I think exactly uh, as you're describing, I think that um, part of um, not having something is that you long for it, right? So I think uh, what I really want in past lives to be is uh, uh, a film about longing. And it's not just the longing between uh, two lovers or something. It's actually, and at times it is, there's a whole section in the film where they uh, long for each other across the screen because yeah. their relationship is across the Pacific Ocean and they're talking over Skype. So in that way, that is actually a very classic longing as lovers, but when they see each other as again as uh, full grown ups, as a you know someone people who are in their mid to late thirties, they suddenly um, uh, long for each other in this um, other way, where actually they long for each other um, as uh, lives, right? As a life that one could have, or the li- life where they could be together, which is the not maybe not maybe not in this life, but the one yeah. next, right? Or, or maybe the one before, right? So, and that, bring up that that theme of inyan. Yes, exactly. The concept of inyan, which is the idea that you know, like everybody that you encounter um, is somebody that you're tied to, uh, not just throughout this particular life, but even the ones before, many, many ones, but hundreds of ones before, and with the hundreds of ones after, right? So I think I think that to me, I'm like, well, um, the longing ends the moment that uh, you're able to have, right? So I think that's part of the reason why I really wanted the the longing uh, for, for for me to uh, deprave them. And in fact, you know, so I because I kept, for example, um, Teo and Greta from uh, touching each other, you know, because, you know, like if they were allowed to touch each other, I think that they would have it would not have meant so much. But I think because they weren't allowed to uh, and they were not doing it. You know, amazing thing about not doing something is that it makes you really want to do it. So yeah. the, the hug became very uh, powerful because, and to them, and they started to just be like, all I want to do is reach over and hug him, right? Yeah, uh, Which I don't and think they would have felt. feel that on the screen, right? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. It reminds, it reminds me of Sarah Silverman's adage of make it a treat. You know, mm-hmm. she, that's what she talks. She's talking about her relationship with cannabis specifically, but mm-hmm. she has this idea that if I don't make it a treat, then... Yeah you know, it won't be special. And if I don't make it special, then I'll do it too often. And just, there's something about that idea yes. um, uh, in general. Thank you for opening that up. And then the next last, que- last question on this book is about reclusiveness versus mm-hmm. omnipresence. So right now you're talking to me, a person you've never met from another country. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the quote from the book that I pulled out in Perfume is, he succeeded in being considered totally uninteresting. People left him alone. And that was all he wanted. Malcolm mm-hmm. Gladwell told us in chapter 37 of this podcast that his career goal was to be left alone. And it seems that the author of this book, Patrick Suskin, has succeeded in doing that. I mean, again, no photos of the guy uh, at all. Uh, he's a, disappeared from literary life. He's still alive. And I checked you out online. And it's like, I don't think you are active or even present on like social platforms and social media, at least much. Um, but of course, for the movie to take off you are conscripted into doing all kinds of interviews and being mm-hmm. very you even said in a recent interview i feel like i have to fly to la every weekend i just yeah. saw that, that interview you did right so <laughs> yeah so i do like if you, so how do you navigate that balance as an artist in the world today what do you want for yourself and is it even possible with the way we've designed the world now well i think that it is uh i mean i'm a i'm a millennial so to me i'm like i am not so uh like I, I don't have the kind of aversion to uh, being visible um, as like Patrick Suskind, who is right. how do how old do you say like seventy something? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. so I think it's a little bit of it is generational. Like I have a pretty uh, dynamic relationship with uh, being online. I have an Instagram, um, but it's just that thing where. But I'm not on it that much. But you know. But I think it is one of those things where um, the 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 uh, job of a director is uh, a much more social. And I think that I actually also prefer that as a writer. I think I have, I have always, uh, part of the reason why I do dramatic work, uh, I make dramatic work. And because before, of course, I made past lives, I was in theater. Like there is a way in which that um, you can be a writer who has a, who has demands that are social. So because for example, when you're making a movie, you have to talk to uh, 200 people every day. Right. That are your cast and crew. And yeah. uh, and they speak to you. And then, you know, uh, and you need to be able to how to you have to you need to be able to know how to speak to every single one of them. 
and you're not going to get left alone. Being left alone is not the something that is quite possible as a film director <laughs> right, <laughs> or right. being in theater generally. So I think that, um, but I think when it comes to feeling like I want to be left alone, I think part of it is that it's just a desire that we as artists, all artists have, which is that like, well, I'm happy to answer these questions now because I do want to be able to uh, feel connected um, to uh, people who are watching the movie and I want uh, people to come watch the movie, you know? <laughs> but yeah. also there is always the, the pain of that where it's like, well, it would be so wonderful uh, if I was just, uh, you know, uh, left alone in it, which is that like, you know, they wouldn't, nobody would uh, bother me about it. Right. Because I, I already made it because that's the yeah, thing too. It's the done. movies are Exactly. The movie's already done and there's nothing I can do to uh, help it except to talk to you, about, uh, talk to people about it, right, you know? Right. So I think that's the kind of the funny relationship to it because the movie's getting up and walking around on its own going to college you know like yeah, it's becoming yeah. an adult yeah, and exactly. i'm just kind it's about of about to get bigger i have a feeling as, as <laughs> so we sit sweet. here oh, let's sit here in the fall like it's gonna <laughs> you're gonna be doing a lot more flights to la um but then you have to make sure you have to figure out the balance you know we interviewed daniels in chapter 101 just four mm-hmm. days before everything everywhere all at once came out and mm-hmm. at the time they were like we don't want to do the award scene circuit. It's going to pull us away from kind of making the next thing. And now here we are in a year out. It's like, you have to, you have to <laughs> either lean into it or lean away from it in a thoughtful mm-hmm. way. And figuring out that balance is really difficult for people. Totally. It's well, difficult think, for me. I think it's difficult always, you know? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Second book, the, it's, which is called chess story by Stefan Z- Z- Zweig. If I said that right, which is Z or Z. W E I G also called the Royal game. This book was written in 1941 published in German in 1943. And it's a short, fascinating little novel written by a Nazi fleeing Jewish author who left Austria in 1934 as Hitler was taking power. And then he was listed in the black book by Hitler. So he even had to flee England and went to, went to Brazil and Rio de Janeiro submitted this manuscript two days before he died by suicide, him and his wife both taking their lives at around age 60. By the way, 100 years ago, Stefan Zweig was one of the most popular authors in the world, most widely translated, most sales of any kind. And this is his very last book. The original covers a painted image of a person sitting at a chess table, the title and the author's name in a red box. My version is the 2006 New York Times or New York Review of Books translation with a painting of a chessboard and a long floor of small black and gray tiles. What's going on in the book? Travelers by ship from New York to Buenos Aires find on board with them as the world champion of chess. They come together to try their skills against them and are soundly defeated. But then a mysterious passenger steps forward and advises them and their fortunes change. How did the mysterious passenger come to possess his extraordinary grasp of this game? That lies at the heart of Zweig's story. File this under 833.912 for literature slash slash German fiction. Celine, tell us about your relationship with Chess Story by Stefan Zweig. Well, I think that, you know, the... Uh, I feel like I'm, I'm a fan of every single one of his books because it was just one of those. Uh, he was a bestseller for a really good reason that his books are just uh, so readable. Like they're like novels where you just can like sit down and read it and it's not uh, what I call like eating vegetables. Yeah, it's no, just it's, so pleasurable. It yeah. feels so it feels like it was, I, I read the book in like two nights or three nights. It's one short like. I think mm-hmm. 85 pages or so. Totally. 84, I mean, 84 page novella. It's just, it's very sumptuous. It's it's really interesting because I think, that I feel this way about also Somerset Moam, where I feel like um, when uh, the writing is so uh, uh, open and so uh, mm. effective and so, uh, what is it? Uh, you know, like available for everybody to just dive into and like you can read it as a teenager and you can you know what I mean you can read it really it can be the first uh big book you read when you're really young like it can be the first like serious literature you read because it is so um it, it's it is like, sumptuous right so um but it's but I think there is a funny thing in literature where be, if it is that there is a way that you treat it as uh, not as serious a book as something that is like so gem packed that it is difficult to read, right? Because it's like yeah. it's more difficult, so it's it's a it must be a better book. But I actually have the completely different uh, philosophy about books that I think that I think uh, every great book should be something that you can walk into if you're a fifteen and you want to try something, right? Ooh, I like um, that. And and I think it's like so 
you know, when I encountered, I encountered this book in, in college and something that I really uh, felt about the book is that uh, it just understood what it is like to let uh, fascism in, live in your own heart. Because the thing is, like, what happens to um, the character who uh, is a, a chess a prodigy, which is, yeah. uh, uh, so, there, so there are actually two people who are incredible at chess. And one of them is a brute. And the other is somebody who became a chess genius because uh, he was um, uh, being imprisoned. Yes. It's kind of an unknown imprisonment, but it's, he's uh, imprisoned. And it has to, it feels it's very connected to Stephen Zweig's like uh, the reason for leaving, which is the Europe under Nazi uh, rule. So yes. he, he so what happened was that he was uh, he was stuck in this one tiny cell. He was there for many many years, and he just had this one book of uh, a chess book, and he, because he had no other uh, nothing else. That so same thing about stimulus de- deprivation here. Exactly, stimulus deprivation. Yeah. Because of that, only thing that he, I kept him from going completely insane, even though he did go uh, quite insane in that way, um, was this was chess. So uh, because in his mind's eye, he was playing chess all night and all day, that he kind of became somebody who uh, just became so, uh, he, just, he just got so, so, so good. But the point of the book is that the the way that the book uh, sort of plays itself out is that even though, uh, so there are two people. One person is somebody who has just been great at chess all his life, who actually dug himself out of poverty through being good at chess, being so great at chess, being a genius at chess. And then there's the other person who was tortured into becoming good at chess. And what happens is the person who was tortured into uh, becoming good at chess because of the tiny cell that... uh, he was stuck in and the fascism that he was uh, under that even though he is now free and on this boat, um, he, uh, he still couldn't help, but let the cell and the, and the fascism live in him. So even though they're free and they're out of the ocean, um, he couldn't escape because in his heart, he was still back there in that cell and he was, or he was still playing chess in his mind in back in that cell. And what happens is the person who uh, became a chess uh, genius, uh, his opponent, the person who became a chess genius uh, more easily, like uh, with, with or or like was not go- going through fascism, he was able to handily psychologically destroy this person who uh, was tortured. And uh, to me, it was it just felt so connected to uh, what Stefan did a- uh, after writing the book. Yeah. Because, right, because he's like, well, he was, uh, he ran away from Europe. I think he, where did he go to again? He went well, to. Well, first um, he went to England in 1934 when Hitler was kind of taking power. But yeah. then he was listed in this black book, which means that it was the people that Hitler was kind of chasing abroad because they were notable mm-hmm. Jews. And he had to flee Europe. And then he went to Rio. And that's where he killed himself. That's what it was. So, so if yeah. you let's say you're in Rio and it's so far away, right? Like this is like time where you have to take a boat to go to Rio, right? So yeah. he went to Rio. And uh, he's so, so far away from Germany, so, so far away from Hitler, but still in his heart, uh, he was uh, still back in Germany. And I think that must have felt so intolerable. And the book is really about that. Right. So it just feels like such a I don't know. It it always felt like such a special book because and again, by the way, again, a great ending. Yeah, a great ending. It's got a a climactic (laughs) scene where a pastor on the boat, actually, this the person you're talking about is talking about his imprisonment with the Nazis. He actually says this quote, nothing on earth exerts such pressure on the human soul as a void. Mm-hmm. Nothing on earth exerts such pressure on the human soul as a void. It made me think of a quote you said on the Variety podcast where you said mm-hmm. that the whole point of the past lives movie is about the characters getting the goodbye that they were owed as children, almost like filling a void of a goodbye mm-hmm. for language and culture and people and so on. Mm-hmm. How do we learn to sort of identify, see, and fill voids in our lives? I think sometimes it's really hard to identify. Right. And sometimes and I usually find that it is uh, literature or movies or TV show or something like that, that will fill that void. And I think that's part of the reason why we're so drawn to stories and why we still uh, read and watch things. Right. Because we want to find out uh, what part of ourselves that we're missing. And then, of course, when you uh, encounter 
uh, things that mean something to you, then I think that it is then able to fill that void. And I think that, you know, of course, uh, my dream for past lives, and I think that, you know, it, it means the most to me when uh, somebody, after having seen the movie, tells me about the void that it filled, is that, you know, like I want it to mean something to someone so that they're uh, part of the thing that they felt like they were mi- that was missing from their lives is a filled. And that's what else can an artist want from their work? Yeah. You know? Yeah, I love that art, art as putty, you know, mm-hmm. filling up holes we didn't <laughs> know were there. Um, that's a beautiful metaphor. Uh, just in the interest of time, I want to move us to your third and final formative book, which is called Too Loud a Solitude by another name I'm going to probably butcher, Bahumil mm-hmm. Hrabal. H-R-A-B-A-L, self-published in Czech in 1976, then eventually translated to English in 1990 by Harcourt Brace. The original cover is a pile of destroyed books in black and white. My cover, I got a slim 98-page paperback. Also read this one. So read this one and the one before. Both Love both of them. With an orange ribbon and an all-caps Art Deco type of font screaming Bohemil Horebel in the center. There's a small cartoon of a man pulling out a book from the spine of another giant book. And the cover blur from the New York Times says, a remarkable story about the indestructibility of books and knowledge. Bohemo Rabel lived in Czechia, also called Czech Republic, from 1914 to 1997, considered one of the all-time best Czech writers. In the early 50s, after communism took over, after the Germans had previously taken over, Rabel came a member of an underground literary group and eventually had his works all banned and his ability to publish also banned. But his writings, such as this book, were circulated in underground Samsadat editions, so self-published editions, printed and circulated hand by hand under kind of the communist regime. It tells the story of Hanta, H-A-N-T-A, a man who has lived in a Czech police state for 35 years, working as a compactor of paper and books. In the process, he's acquired an education so unwitting he can't quite tell which of his own thoughts are his and which have come from his books. He's rescued many books from the jaws of hydraulic presses, and now his house is filled to the rooftop with books. But when a new automatic press makes his job redundant, there's only one thing he can do. Go down with the ship. Files under 891.863 for Czech fiction. Tell us about your relationship, Celine, with Too Loud a Solitude. I mean, I feel like now that we're all talking about these books, I think that I think you can see a bit of a, uh, a theme emerge, you know? <laughs> I think that um, I think I'm really drawn by uh, the, the stories about um, people who uh, are uh, under the... I don't know, under the pressure of something, under the under the kind of the weight of their times, right? Under the weight of uh, power and are crushed under it and are able to somehow hold on to their, uh, hold on to who they are or try to uh, do something for it, you know? So I think that to me is really at the heart of this uh, particular book. It, it first, I mean, first of all, Bohemian Herbal is one of the, the most beautiful writers ever, like the language in his books are yeah. so incredible. Yeah. Um, I mean, of course I'm reading translation, but even in translation, um, the, the, the metaphors or the, the way that um, words are string strung together it still comes through. And it's really, I think it, what reading it is, it is like eating chocolate. Like it feels yes. like I'm, I'm eating something that is so delicious because um, I can just live in it forever. Like the first line of the book yes. is so incredible you know for 35 years now i've been in waste paper and it's my love story (laughs) it's so stunning you know (laughs) it's perfect and i think to me it's like well he is somebody who um and this is true about all of his books he you know like i think we're talking about uh beautiful endings but i think that he is somebody who begins books uh so beautifully that i'm already it feels like he writes in a way where i'm just like deep in it from the beginning and what's amazing about um, Bohemil Herbal is that, like, you know, uh, he's so funny. You know, he's got such a sense of humor. I think that's true about the other two books as well. But, like, he is, like, to me, like, laugh out loud funny because it's, because it's like, it's as though, like, uh, like a young boy who uh, wants to make fart jokes is writing the book. 
Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, and it's also very readable. You know, they're very, all yes. three of your books are extremely literary and extremely accessible at the same time. Mm-hmm time it's also you know uh the name of the book is interesting too loud a solitude right past lives is one of the i would say one of the quietest movies i've ever seen at times it felt like a meditation you know there's emotion on screen that always feels loud but i thought interesting that this book is called too loud a solitude twice in the book i've pulled out that phrase so he's mentioned that phrase kind of right in there i thought i'd ask you what you think our current relationship is with quiet and solitude in the world and how might we harness or grow back these skills if even though you're a millennial you feel that we are you know impoverished in this regard in some way well i think that you know part of being a millennial uh and i know you're a millennial which is like yeah. this thing where we kind of are in the funny limbo in between funny uh liminal space between our older generation who uh maybe don't have as close a relationship to internet and the younger generation um who have a very serious relationship to internet and i think that um, sort of being in the middle, I'm, it's funny because I can speak uh, the language of uh, both as a result of, you know, being born at this particular time. So I think I take that respons- I th- take that as a very serious responsibility in a way. Um, but something it won't that be I long also- before we're the last generation that knew life before the Internet. Exactly. So I think yeah. that I feel a tremendous amount of uh, concern for it. There is like a very real... Uh, uh, fear. I remember, so there's a, a book, uh, I forget what the name of the book is, but Gabriel Marcel, who is a philosopher, he talks about um, how uh, radio, at the time that it came out, and he's, he's, he's really religious, so he, at the time that radio came out, uh, he thought that it was sin, because he thought that um, it allowed one person's voice to be uh, omnipresent. And therefore mm. omnipotent. So mm. if you have radio in everybody's house and if somebody is able to speak through it, that person has become God. And in any, in any way that you're trying to become God is sinning. So t- t- he thought that radio was sin. And my college paper, because I was a philosophy minor, um, was about how, like, what would Gabriel Marcel think about the Internet? Because the truth is that, like, we're all omnipresent and we're, all, we're also at times omnipotent, too. Right. So I think that I am very concerned about um, the way that, uh, uh, you know, that part of human life is disappearing so quickly. And something that, of course, is always a part of conversation about progress is that, of course, technological progress and things like that is going to march on. Right. It's going to march on uh, relentlessly and quickly. And it's part of history. But the truth is that uh, the humanity and the human race and the way that our morality and the way uh, we're going to progress as people, as people outside of the technological progress or any kind of kind of progress, is going to uh, uh, need catch up, and we feel the need for catch up every day, right? We are really, really falling behind uh, the technology that is getting away from us. So there are uh, moral questions that we are just not. We just don't feel equipped to, and we it is just not a part of the public forum the way that I really think it should be, right? And then I like think which that, que- like which questions? Well, I mean, like I feel like I think it is a question about like, uh, oh, I feel like fascism looks very differently now, right? And I think that um, way um, information is uh, moving is always going to get faster than the way that we can form uh, uh, our moral stance as individuals and as yeah. a collective, right? Yeah, we don't have time to react. We don't have time to react because yeah. it's, and it's, and it's all hype, right? It's right. all, and it social is media all... is only 5,000 days old. We're just learning now that it's kind of bad oh, for yeah. us, right? Yeah. Things <laughs> it's like, like that, all well, it, you're like, you're like, there's no way that it can be good for us because I'm like, well, who's going to look at what, right? And it's like, and it's not going to be the, the most decent thing or, or the most, uh, uh, most, uh, meaningful thing that's going to get looked at. It's not right. right? And, and what you say becomes true because like exactly as Gabriel Marcel was concerned about, you know, like if you say something and you're omnipresent and omnipotent, maybe it's, maybe it's true. Right. And it's very yeah. scary in that way. But anyway, all that to say, I think that to too loud of solitude has been something that I uh, feel connected to uh, uh, all the time, because I think that that really does describe the way that, I mean, it's, that is, you know, the title is just, the title is title's fire. It's so yeah, good because, yeah, yeah, yeah. because three fire like, emojis. It's three yeah. fire emojis. I guess it's like, yeah, well, you know, too yeah. loud of solitude is like, 
I think that this it's and I think I love that it described this um, man in uh, you know Czechia's uh, life uh, many many years ago, many decades ago. Um, this thing that I know I feel every day. It's like wow, is it that it's this the solitude that I feel, or the way that um, way that this is uh, is blaring. <laughs> Not like it is. Yeah. It is. It is a really amazing thing. You're like, well, it is just at the. Uh, it is like being screamed at the top of your lungs, and the thing that is that you're feeling is uh, complete and utter loneliness. Anyway, so I guess I guess what I'm trying to say is all three of the books I'm realizing are um, about uh, about solitude in some way, about being yeah. lonely, and something that I talk about with uh, past lives sometimes is that like, well, you know, um, they ask. Sometimes I get asked like, you know, like what has been the uh, you know, what's been something that is notable or what have you loved about releasing the movie to the world or sharing the movie? I think I usually say like, well, what's amazing is that it really did come from this one personal and very intimate and just myself kind of a, from solitude of a feeling that I had sitting in this bar where I felt like, wow, nobody else here will know what this feels like, right? Right. And then, of course, as the movie is coming out after describe, the movie is just a deep description of that feeling. You know, it's just yeah, like as yeah. deep as I can allow. Like it is yeah. as much. Uh, it is a it is a description of that particular feeling of um, sitting in that bar, sitting between these two parts uh, of your own self, trying to speak to each other, right? And me having to translate. And there are two different uh, loves in my life, right? And I think that to me, when in, when that was going on, I thought that, wow, this is such a specific thing that is happening to me only. And then, of course, as the movie is coming out, and this, of course, happened in the making of the movie with hundreds of people. And then, of course, it happened again as the movie comes out to people uh, globally. It's that, like, well, I feel less lonely, right? Because I think everybody uh, can feel... Uh, so many people have, have told me how personal uh the connection was to the movie Abs- that they have absolutely right and they feel like they're like i know exactly what that feels like and what an amazing thing and i just been feeling uh less and less lonely with each person who tells me that oh right? that's so interesting what an incredible yeah. manifestation of that emotion into this piece of art <laughs> celine song what a treat it is to connect with you and talk with you and this conversation has been wonderful we've talked about solitude navigating invisible pressures filling voids and getting the goodbyes we all deserve celine song thank you so much for the artistic achievement masterpiece of this past lives i encourage everybody to go out and see it and i really appreciate your time to come on free bucks thank you so much thank you so much all right hey everybody it's neil pastrich and i'm hanging out with you back in my basement listen back to that wonderful conversation with the incredible celine song ah so many quotes jump out to me from that chat i mean uh, i'm gonna pull out what i'm gonna do and if, if you listen to the end of the show a lot you know what i always try to do is i pick out kind of three quotes that jump out to me So here's a few quotes that jump out to me. I look to the book Perfume as guidance for how I look at my own endings. I want the ending to feel like the meal you've been waiting for finally arrives. I just like that concept. I like that artists are creating things that finish. It's hard to finish. It's always hard to write the ending, but that's really good. That's why I made that joke that you didn't like Lost. Because you feel, you, you know, as a viewer, you feel so ripped off if things don't close. Two, this is the central point in past lives. In Yan is the idea that everybody you encounter is somebody you're tied to, not just in this life, but in hundreds of lives before and hundreds of lives after. Perhaps related to car- concepts of karma and dharma in different cultures, or the idea that y- you being here matters, that you're not just a blip on the earth and a blip off the earth, but you're from something before and you're to something in the future. And we know that's true, right? Like you pass along values you, you create wisdom and culture gets through us and also it's probably true well it is true molecularly right like we our atoms and our molecules are made of parts of other people and parts of other carbons and parts of the universe i mean we are stars there's that great children's book uh, about that neil degrasse tyson also says that all the time you were stars you know i like that idea 
Uh, three, part of being a millennial is that you're in a funny liminal space between the older generation, who doesn't have as close a relationship with the internet, and the younger generation, who basically was born in the internet. I take that as a serious responsibility. I feel concerned for it. I mean, isn't it interesting? I was born at the end of 1979, so technically, I guess I'm three months before. I was born September 17th, 79. I guess I'm technically not a millennial since they say it starts in 1980, depending where you look. But yeah, I remember life before the internet. I remember it fondly, probably with rose-colored glasses, but I, 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 not fearful, I don't think I'd go as far as Celine, but like there's something to the fact that like pretty soon, life before the internet will be like this sort of, like this really, it's like remembering life before cars, right? Like it's, you're going, we're going away. And so there is a responsibility, I think, because so much of life before the internet, yeah, it wasn't as convenient. You couldn't send a message from the ba your basement to hundreds of thousands of people around the world like I'm doing right now. But you could also, um, you know, uh, maybe be yourself a little bit more, or there was just more weirdness in the world. There was less homogenization. There was less uniform brands and cultures and global this and global that. And we weren't all speaking on the same three or four places. So we didn't have the same tones of voice and ways of speaking. I mean, I re even remember in the early internet when people get on message boards, it was like, it was like they were speaking different languages, even though they were all speaking English because of the culture being so localized. And I do miss parts of that. Anyway, she's making me think about it. Um, I kept Teo and Greta from touching each other. The amazing thing about not doing something is that it makes you really want to do it. Great piece of wisdom in there. And then finally, just to continue my rant on social media. On social media, it's not the most decent or meaningful that gets looked at. Just in general, that's a great thing to remember. It's not the most decent or the most meaningful. I'm not saying this is the most decent and meaningful thing uh, going on, this conversation, but it was decent and meaningful to me. And certainly, when I post it on YouTube or post it on Apple Podcasts, it will not even be a drop in the ocean of conversation about Donald Trump, right? It just won't be because that is controversial and he's got weird hair and he's doing outlandish things. So that gets the clicks and it, you know, makes our amygdala and our brain secrete the hormones that want us to keep safe and et cetera, et cetera. So just remembering that social media is not promoting the most decent or meaningful, I think is helpful, and I like the way Celine put it. Celine Song also gave us three wonderful books to add to our top 1,000, including number 612, Perfume, by Patrick Suskin. Can't recommend this book enough. It is, when you heard her describe that final scene, you may have been scared off the book. That final scene is like one page, and it does not ruin the book. The book is not about that final scene. It's like knowing the ending of Frankenstein or something. Like, the purpose of this book, this is like an amazing piece of literature. But it's open to her point. It's it's just even the description of smells in this book. Oh my gosh, perfume is a winner. It's in my book club, by the way, in January. So if you uh, don't get my book club, you can sign up at neil.blog. And the last Saturday morning of every single month for the last something like, must be getting close to 100 months now. I started in 2016. I write a review of every book I've read that month. No ads, no sponsors, just like the podcast. And then there's number 611, Chess Story by Stefan Zweig. Uh, that's Z or Z W E I G. I also wrote this book. It's 84 pages. It's wonderful. It's really good. Highly recommend it. And it reads like a short story, you know? Like it could be, you know, a George Saunders piece. Uh, not that, that, that bizarre, but just in terms of its length. And then finally, number 610, Too Loud a Solitude by the most prominent Czech writer probably in the 20th century, Bokumil Hrabal, H R A B A L. Um, Again, I read it, and again, I loved it. I realize all three of these books are not written in English, and it's interesting because Past Lives has much more Korean than you might expect, right? But it flip-flops between languages and cultures as Celine does, as her books do, as hopefully our conversations on three books do as well. Aren't we all just in this more homogenized, flattened world? Aren't we all still clinging and reaching for the elements and parts of our personality to help us illuminate who we are to ourselves? That's the nature of stories. I hope that's the nature of three books. I really, really thank you and appreciate you for being here and staying with me all the way to the end. Until next time, let's remember that we are what we eat and we are what we read. Let's keep turning that page, everybody, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Hi, Neil. This is Maureen. I live in Stratford, Ontario. I have never called one of these. I have just listened to Chapter 7, the interview you did with the Uber driver, Vish, 
and I'm super invested in this man. I called my son who lives in Toronto and told him all about it and asked him to listen. I've never taken an Uber in my life because there are no Ubers in my little city. But I'm super invested in him, and now it's 2024, and I need to know what happened to him. Is I can't imagine he's still driving Uber after uh, COVID, and I hope he has his dream job now, and I cannot believe that people have overlooked this incredible human. So if there is some way, whether it's in your newsletter, which I subscribe to, or in your podcast, please let us know what's happened to him. Thanks so much. Hey, Maureen from Stratford, Ontario. Uh, thank you so much for prompting me to reach back out to Vish, who was our guest back in Chapter 7, and who I just featured a few pages from uh, earlier this year as well. Um yeah, I'm sad to say I don't know. Uh, I tried texting Vish and the text went from blue, you know, when it's like blue because you're both on an iPhone, to green. So I was like, did he change his phone? Is this still his phone? And then I went back to the email address, which he gave me permission to share with listeners. He did give me permission to share that I recall. I asked him, can I share this email address with listeners? And he said, yeah. So it's connectvishwas at gmail.com, C-O-N-N-E-C-T-V-I-S-H-W-A-S at gmail.com. And I haven't heard back. I haven't heard back and I've waited, waited a while. So I'm like, uh, Vish, where are you, buddy? Um, if you want to reach out to Vish, you could try that email address. But we got to get on top of what's going on with Vish now. I absolutely, I absolutely agree. I'm like looking for him online. I'm like, can't find, I can't find it on him online. I'm, Vish, where are you? If you're listening to this, get back in touch. Give us a call. Tell us what's going on, how life is going. I really do want to reconnect with you. So I'm hoping that this gives us the uh, the wherewithal to kind of, because I'm looking online and I'm just finding a whole bunch of other Vishwas Agarwals, because Agarwals are a really common name in India. So I guess Vish is a common first name too, but Vish, come back to us, okay? Now, um, for a letter of the chapter, this chapter's letter comes from Jill. These are reviews. People leave them on iTunes. People leave them. Just leave a review. If I read your letter on the air, like I'm going to read one right now, you get a free book. I'm going to I'm gonna mail you a free signed book. Just drop me a line with your address. Jill Thoreau from Wisconsin, well, no, Washington. Wenatchee, when 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 Washington says, I'm really enjoying the podcast three books. I decided to go back and start from the beginning, and the first installments are just as relevant as the recent ones. I love the fact that you interview the woman who owns the corner store because so many podcasters just interview famous people and never any normal people who've also succeeded in their own right, but basically aren't famous. She was an amazing and thoughtful person, and I loved what she had to say. Uh, thank you so much, Jill. Drop me a line with your address so I can send you a thank you. Uh, and now it's time for the word of the chapter. And for this chapter's word, let's head back to the one and only Celine song. Here we go. Everybody in his city um, uh, has an orgy. Yes, indeed. We're going to go with orgy. Orgy. How could we not take up the opportunity to go with that word? Interesting, though, it doesn't necessarily mean what you think. Orgy is a noun, which according to Merriam-Webster has three definitions. Number one is secret ceremonial rites held in honor of an ancient Greek or Roman deity, usually characterized by ecstatic singing and dancing. Okay. Two. Uh, a drunken revelry or a sexual encounter involving many people, which is the version I knew of it. Um, but interesting, it's actually the first version that really climaxes that book, Perfume, kind of, I think. That's how I read it anyway. And number three, excessive indulgence in something especially to satisfy an inordinate appetite or craving, like an orgy of destruction, a natural orgy of thrill-seeking and risk-taking. Where did this word come from? Well, it came from the 1500s from the French uh, for secret rites or ceremonies in the worship of certain Greek and Roman gods, perhaps directly from the Greek orgia, O-R-G-I-A, which means secret rites, secret rites, potentially considered a derivative of the word ergon, which means work or activity, secret work, secret activity, drunken revelry with with a, a, a many person sexual encounter. That is how the book Perfume climaxes it. But knowing the ending 
honestly does not affect that book at all you really must read it it's a wonderful wonderful book no no book shame no book guilt. you don't have to read it but i recommend that novel substantially sumptuous as Celine might say well here we are at the end of chapter 133 and until next time remember that you are what you eat and you are what you read keep turning that page everybody and i'll talk to you soon take care